they destroyed the mold when he was made. A great planner, you know, he's a great father. He's a very whole person. He has an agenda, and he's disciplined, and he's focused. And uh, so he's very modest about uh, uh, his background. Ed was a very private person, still is. But I think adventurous is a much better word. He's a cowboy, he's a pilot, he's a scuba diver, he's a corporate warrior. As a person, he is a businessman, uh, he's a philanthropist, he's a uh, husband, a father, a foundation executive, a community activist. All those things are what Ed Ball is in, uh, in our community. Edmund F. Ball's life has spanned all 10 decades of the 20th century. For half of that century, he was actively involved in the company that bears his name on fruit jars and beverage containers worldwide. The former president and chairman of Ball Corporation has witnessed astonishing changes throughout the past 10 decades, from fruit jars to satellites, as Ed would say. His company grew from a family glass business to a publicly held Fortune 500 corporation. He was born in 1905, but the story of his parents helped set the scene. Ed's father, Edmund Burke Ball, was one of the five Ball brothers who would forever change a city called Muncie, Indiana. Seven Ball children were born into a hardworking, entrepreneurial, and inventive family on a homestead in Ohio. In 1880, Edmund and his brother Frank bought a small business in Buffalo, New York, making wood jacketed cans used for shipping kerosene and oils. The young men prospered, the name was changed, and Ball Brothers Company was founded in 1882. Eventually, all five boys, Frank, Edmund, William, George, and Lucius, would form the family business. When the lining of the kerosene containers was changed from tin to glass, the brothers ventured into the glass business and began making fruit jars for home canning. After a fire destroyed their buffalo plant in 1886, they searched for a location in the gas belt where fuel for glass making would be less expensive. Natural gas had been discovered quite by accident and now towns near the gas wells would benefit by industrial growth. Businessmen in Muncie, a small city unheard of by the Ball brothers, promised them $5,000, seven acres, and an endless supply of natural gas if they'd build a factory there. Frank and Edmund, then bachelors in their early 30s, took the offer and began making glass jars and bottles in 1888. Headquarters remained in Buffalo until Frank C. Ball married a prominent local girl and decided to settle in Muncie. The five Ball brothers did not move from Buffalo to Muncie at the same time. After Frank was permanently settled, the other four joined him over a period of 14 years. They purchased a large parcel of land outside of town, above the White River, and called it Minatrista, a word for meeting place by the waters. Eventually, all five brothers would live along the river. You've heard about the father's side of Edmund F. Ball's family, but his mother, Bertha Crosley, had a distinguished family as well. Daughter of a Universalist minister and a world-traveling tour guide, Bertha was a Vassar graduate herself. Her father had served Muncie's Universalist church at one time, so Edmund and Bertha met when the Crosleys visited in the home of Frank and Bessie Ball. The 1903 newspaper account of their wedding said Edmund B. Ball had been Indiana's most eligible bachelor. My parents were married in 1903. I think it was in the summertime. They took their honeymoon, their vacation, first to the gold fields of Colorado, where, where my father had had some interest in one of the gold mines. It didn't turn out too well. They went on from there to uh, California. After their honeymoon, they returned back to Muncie and settled down in a house in East Washington Street, where I was born in 1905. When Ed was born, uh, Muncie was a bustling city with an approximate population on the high side of 20,000. 
even though the gas boom had ended. Uh, the gas supply was depleted in about 15 years from its discovery. Uh, it had brought Muncie into the industrial era. And basically, uh, we were an industrial city instead of a rural city. By 1905, at Ball Brothers Glass Manufacturing Company, we had 1,200 people, men mainly, uh, making 60 million glass jars a year. Andrew Carnegie gave the city $50,000 for a new public library. The Muncie Evening Press was founded. The Commercial Club, which was a predecessor to the Chamber of Commerce, uh, also came along. And it bragged of a city uh, with 80% paved roads, trolley cars, and electric interurbans connecting the city with other places in Indiana. Just outside town, in a new area called Normal City, a small college campus was the site of an unsuccessful attempt at higher education. Eastern Indiana Normal University opened in 1899, soon to close. Although there were a few automobiles, railroads were still the primary means of transportation for vacationers. At the turn of the century, the Ball family discovered a cool vacation spot at Leland, Michigan. This is the sandy shore of Lake Michigan, and these resort communities attracted people because they were had, you know, cooler summers. Um, they were small, small communities that were safe for families and children. Um, no hay fever was one of the big selling points because the railroads did promote northern Michigan towns that were served by their railroads for as resort communities. So a lot of families probably got the word of these communities that way. The Ball family was one of the original resort families in the Leland community. I'm told that I spent my first summer in Leland, Michigan, summer home up there. I was about six months old. Of course, I don't remember much about that, but I'm told that we had a small place where we stayed and uh, used a trunk tray for my cradle or crib and mother had taken with her a classmate from Vassar as a companion. I'm not sure that father went up there with us, but I can't imagine his not being there at some time during our time up there in Leland. While Ed was a baby, his father supervised the building of a new home on Minnetrista Boulevard. He took considerable pride and personal interest in the completion of the impressive Indiana limestone mansion called Nebosham meaning bend in the river. In 1907, the Edmund Ball family, now with a second son named Crosley, moved into their dream home. Crosley and I played together and were taken for exciting walks in the fairgrounds and back of the house, even as far out as Kitzelman Woods in West Muncie. Frank Elliott, cousin nearest my age, who lived next door, and I became very close friends. In that era, many children had their tonsils and adenoids removed. When Ed was almost six, his brother Crosley died at age four from hemorrhaging after a simple tonsillectomy. I remember Frank and I tiptoeing into the room where my brother Crosley lay in his bed as if asleep. His face was cold and stiff. At Beach Grove Cemetery, I remember his little casket being placed in the newly built mausoleum. It was in December. There was a, a fragrance of flowers. And I remember Father saying emotionally how very cold it was. Crosley's death deeply affected the family, especially Bertha. Oh, that, she never got over that, never. It was uh, too bad, it was a time uh, when, when nobody knew what to do, you know, for something like that. You know, he died of a, a tonsillectomy. There were no more large parties in the ballroom on the third floor. Mother seldom played the piano. She directed her talents and interests to family affairs and civic activities. 
But for all these years, she never forgot Crosley. When she died nearly half a century later, Crosley's little blue sailor suit was found folded neatly in the bottom of her dresser drawer. In the years following Crosley's death, two daughters were born, Adelia, nicknamed Diggy, and Janice. When Adelia was small, the Balls hired artist Olive Rush to paint a portrait of the three children, even though Crosley had died. Young Ed posed for both boys. People sometimes ask me what it was like to grow up in that big stone house, and they seem to be kind of surprised when I say it was really sort of lonely. See, it was a long ways from downtown in those days, and uh, there weren't very, very many children that lived out in that area that could come and play. So uh, I had to spend a lot of time by myself reading books and doing things around the house. The original McKinley School was located on North Mulberry Street. Ed was driven to school by his mother in her Baker Open, a two-seater electric car. She thought the school was too far away for Ed to ride his bicycle or walk. To go to town or to school, we crossed Walnut Street Bridge over the White River. It was running red from rust from the Kitzelman wire mill, contained contaminants from the Whiteley foundry, and smelled the refuse from Keener's packing plant on Centennial. It was common practice in those days to dump untreated waste into the river. My father, an early proponent of a clean river, would be pleased and proud of the White River as it runs today. City fathers led by the Ball brothers laid the cornerstone to the Young Men's Christian Association building, declaring they were building character, not industry. Eight-year-old Ed Ball was at the ceremony. Also in Muncie, local doctors founded Home Hospital, which soon proved to be too small for the services needed. And in 1913, the biggest flood to ever hit Muncie inundated the area along the White River. Water rose to the planking on the Walnut Street, High Street, and Elm Street bridges. I remember looking down Elm Street from the bridge with my father. He waved at his cousin, Al Bingham, standing on the roof of his porch a couple of blocks away. When Ed was 10, his father took him to his first real moving picture, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, starring Lillian Gish. Europe was at war. A German submarine torpedoed the British ship Lusitania, killing 1,200 passengers, including Americans. A popular government poster showed Kaiser Wilhelm inside a ball jar. The caption read, Can the Kaiser. Patriotism was high. The ball women, like others, prepared Red Cross bandage kits for the wounded. I was a Boy Scout during World War I, and uh, Boy Scouts tried to do things that would be helpful. I sold Liberty Bonds, I guess, mostly to my relatives. And my mother even tried to teach me how to knit socks, but I never could turn the heel, and I feel sorry for the soldiers who had to try to wear those socks. I'm sure they used them for mufflers or hand warmers or something else. On November 11, 1918, the fire bells rang, steam whistles blew, and countless thousands from factories, stores, and offices in Muncie poured into the streets to celebrate the signing of the armistice. Life in Muncie soon returned to peacetime activities. Most of Ed's summers were spent in Leland, Michigan, where the Ball brothers had built homes on the shore of Lake Michigan in an area called Indiana Woods, a nod to the home state of the folks called resorters. Families escaped the hot industrial cities and steamy houses for the cooler climate and quiet of vacation homes. Ed spent many happy summers there as a member of a group called the Seven Boy Cousins. When we were up there, he and the boys uh, uh, had this cabin. It was back there in the woods and I'm sure much closer than what we all remembered. But I used to go back in there and, and sort of spy on them, to, you know, see what they were doing. Here I was, just this little thing. Well, during those years, basically, the Muncie YMCA established a summer camp for young 
Muncie boys. And soon it found a permanent location on Little Lake Tippecanoe or Lake James, uh, west of North Webster. And it was renamed Camp Crosley in honor of Ed's uh, deceased brother. And the camp is still in business uh, nearly 80 years later. In 1917, Frank C. and Edmund B. Ball and their wives bought the property of the failed teacher's college on the edge of town and donated it to the state of Indiana. The school became the eastern branch of Indiana State Teachers College. During the 20s, the Ball brothers donated funds to build Ball Gymnasium and a residence hall for women called Lucina Hall, all this in honor of their sister. Today, the school is Ball State University. After McKinley School, Ed spent a year at Muncie High School and was introduced to the purple and white of the Muncie Bearcats. The next year, he and his cousin Frank were enrolled in Brooks School for Boys in Indianapolis, later to become Park Tudor. The boys would take the interurban on Sunday afternoon to Indianapolis and return home on Friday. Ed finished high school in 1923 at Asheville School in North Carolina at the edge of the Smoky Mountains. When Ed was a senior there, he was editor of the yearbook and captain of the rowing crew. He debated in the Kit Kat Club and played football and basketball. During these years, women won the right to vote. Radio stations signed on the air, and because of prohibition, Muncie supported a few speakeasies. Ed went off to college, first to Wabash College in Crawfordsville, Indiana, then to Yale University the alma mater of his uncle, Ferdinand Crosley. In the early 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan was active in Muncie, targeting blacks, Jews, and especially Roman Catholics. Yeah, it was a very traumatic time when we did that history of Negroes in Muncie. A lot of people could remember the trauma and the terror when the Klan marched through the town, you know, at will, you know, led by the mayor in some cases, by the police chief. During the heyday of Klan activity, Ed himself was away at school. Although many businessmen and politicians were members of the Klan, there is no record of Ball family involvement. In the mid-twenties, researchers Robert and Helen Lind lived in Muncie, conducting a study of the lives of people in a town they called representative of Middle America. Referring to Muncie by the anonymous term Middletown, their study, published in 1929, became the seminal work of sociological literature. When Ed Ball's father, Edmund Burke Ball, died in 1925, the Lynns found it remarkable that the whole town stopped to mourn the loss of its great citizen and industrialist. Edmund had set aside money to establish Ball Brothers Foundation, which provided funds to build Ball Memorial Hospital. Later, his family erected a lasting tribute to their husband and father, E.B. Ball, a statue by Cyrus Dallin called Appeal to the Great Spirit, located near Minatrista Boulevard. When Charles Lindbergh flew solo across the Atlantic in 1927, Ed Ball took special notice. Two years later, he would take up flying himself. He graduated from Yale in 1928 with a Bachelor of Philosophy degree and returned home. I had thought some about going to a postgraduate school, law or banking, business or something. Talked to my uncles about it and they thought probably I should come back to the plant or to the factory and learn something about the business first. In 1929, the stock market crashed and the nation fell into an economic depression. 25% of Muncie workers were out of jobs. You know, I recall people going around, you know, looking in garbage can rummaging for food uh, in, in the Whiteley neighborhood area that I grew up in. I started in the factory as a laborer, really, so I could get kind of a feel and get to know people in the factory, which proved to be very important to me. And as time went on, I remember particularly going to work there and people standing at the gate and on the streets nearby, hoping they would find a, a job, any kind of a job. And I remember that the hours of the factory were changed so that more people could be given jobs. For instance, if they had to, used to have 
12 hour shifts, they cut those down into eight and six so that more people could uh, be employed. Financial panic in many cities and towns caused a run on the banks. People who lost confidence in their banks wanted their money in hand, so they'd line up at the windows and withdraw it all. But Muncie was different. Muncie fearing a bank run, a bank panic, in March, I'm going to say early March of, of uh, 33, Frank Ball makes a statement that the family and the company are leaving their money in the banks. They're not withdrawing. And the idea is that, not that there's an infusion of ball cash that's going in, that didn't happen, um, not anything terribly unusual, but by saying that we're leaving our money in, we're saying that the banks are sound. Therefore, therefore there's no reason for you to withdraw your funds and there's no reason for you to panic about the future of these banks. And Muncie never had a bank run. During the Depression, the demand for home canning jars actually increased, and the Ball Brothers Company prospered. In mid-1929, Ed Ball stopped out of curiosity at the Silver Fox Airport west of Muncie. Before he knew it, he had signed up for flying lessons in a travel air powered by a classic World War I OX-5 engine. This early aviator would continue flying for the next 70 years. I am soloed October of 1929 in an OX-5 airplane and just uh, 11 days later my instructor and another student were killed. In 1931 Ed bought his first airplane a shiny red Waco F. His mother was his first passenger. Cousin Frank Elliott also working for the family company soon joined Ed in his new venture flying would become a way of life. In 1932, Kokomo's flying farmer, Clyde Shockley, was persuaded to come to Muncie to help form Muncie Aviation Company. Like their fathers before them, Frank and Ed Ball would go into business together. That small aviation company is still operating at the Muncie Airport on North Walnut. Tragically, Ed's cousin and friend, Frank Elliott Ball, was killed in 1936 in an airplane accident caused by a structural failure. The next year, Elliott Hall, the beautiful stone dormitory at the college, was built and named in his memory. I've often thought uh, what might have happened if Frank had lived, how many things we might have done together. He was a brilliant young man and uh, had a wonderful future ahead of him. Robert Lind of Middletown fame came back to Muncie in 1935 for a follow-up study. Ten years earlier, the Linds had deliberately chosen Muncie for their sociological study because it wasn't a college or company town. What was reported in their 1937 book, Middletown in Transition, was a very different Muncie indeed. The Linds admitted in Middletown in Transition that they overlooked two rather important features of community life in Muncie when they wrote Middletown. One of those was the influence of the family, the Ball family, and how important it was to Muncie. The other one was the Teachers College and how significant that had become in the life of the community. In the second book, the Lynns devoted a whole chapter to the Balls, referring to them only as the X family. The sociology team may have overstated the Ball's influence in the community. They said the X family controlled the town in industry, banking, health care, church, even charity. At the time the Lynns first came to Muncie and did their documentary, I was away at school, so I wasn't very much aware of it. But um, by the time they came here for, and wrote the second book, I was pretty well aware of what my family thought about it and some of the things they had said about the family X, which it was plainly the Ball family. The citizens of Muncie understood, though. In 1937, toward the end of the Great Depression, more than 11,000 people contributed hard-earned money to erect a sculpture by Daniel Chester French in honor of the Ball family generosity. Called Beneficence, the sculpture stands today on the Ball State campus honoring the five brothers for whom the college was named. In 1936, Ed had married Isabel Urban from Anderson. 
the next few years, Ed settled into marriage and fatherhood while accepting more business, civic, and church responsibilities. Their first son, Frank Edmund, was born in 1938, and Ed was slowly working his way up at Ball Brothers. In 1940, he and Isabel built a home in Leland on the shore of Lake Michigan so the family's tradition could be continued. But this tranquil life would not last long. Back in 1931, I joined the ROTC and wound up as a first lieutenant infantry. I had almost forgotten about it until 10 years later, in 1941, I got a letter with a red border around it said, Edmund F. Ball, first lieutenant infantry, report for active duty for one year. Well, I had a family, Isabel and I had been married number of years and had a son Frank and another baby on the way and uh, I had a job at the factory so I had to explain this to Isabel who was a good sport about it and to my uncle Frank and I pointed out to both it was only one for one year of course it turned out to be four years Ed asked his brother-in-law, John Fisher, to fill in for him during his absence at Ball Brothers. He wanted me to come to Muncie because uh, he felt like uh, it was important that I uh, at least know something about the situation here um, and the fact that he was going into the service. So I came to Muncie with the idea of being here a week and then going back to this job in Kingsport. Uh, after being here a week, why, uh, at which time Ed claims he told me everything he knew about glass manufacturing in one week and a lot of other things with regard to family responsibilities. And so I, uh, at the end of that week, I was prepared to go back, uh, but uh, GA Ball entered the picture and said that uh, he wanted me to stay here for the summer. The threat of war interrupted life all across the United States as troops began to muster. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, I was already on active duty and uh, actually was in the Army Industrial College in Washington, D.C. and ran into a friend of mine from Muncie, actually, Ray Prescott Johnson, who was also a first lieutenant, and he said, have you heard what happened? And I said, no, and he said, why, the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. Ed's one year turned out to be four years away from Muncie, almost two years of it overseas. He served as a staff officer for General Mark Clark in England, Africa, and Italy, and was promoted to the rank of major. He was air support officer for 5th Army units for three major campaigns, participating in the assaults of Sicily, Salerno, and Anzio. He earned commendations and the Bronze Star. It was in the, the hills uh, around the Salerno that I first got a letter from my Uncle George. Dear Ed, our feelings are that your services here at home are badly needed. I hope you'll understand our efforts to seek your return from active duty as soon as possible to assume the leadership our company now needs. Affectionately, Uncle George. After the Angio experience and all, I did receive orders to return back to the States. I felt that uh, I was kind of leaving just as we were beginning to move forward. A big campaign was underway to take Rome, and I left just before that. and. Back in the States, I read about it with uh, some envy that I had uh, left the action uh, before the big event happened. It was back here in the States, still uh, on active duty, but not a part of the big show. Ed returned to the United States and his growing family. Another year passed while he waited for his release from active duty. Daughter Marilyn had been born in 1942 son Fred in 1945. On January 2nd, 1945, while Ed was still on active duty, Ball Brothers Factory Number 1 burned. 
but the devastating fire somehow seemed symbolic of the challenges the company faced and how it survived. No production was lost. But what Ed saw when he returned alarmed him. The war had taken its toll on plants, equipment, and personnel. Ball Brothers Company then had had a pretty tough time during the war and it come plants were run down and we didn't really have um, the type of people in there that it would take to rejuvenate this comp company. Uh, in fact, they were getting our, some of our competitors were saying that Ball was the most decadent company in the industry. They used that against us, but had to change that image as rapidly as it could. When Ed became president of Ball Brothers in 1948, he presented four alternatives to the board of directors and the stockholders. Number one, we could liquidate the company. Number two, try to sell it as a going concern. Number three, try to merge with some other company. And number four, to see what we could do ourselves to modernize and keep the company going. Ed's decision to bring in outside management was supported by the younger members of the organization, including his brother-in-law, John Fisher. It was a tough decision because bringing some outsiders into a previously very private company uh, brought about a number of uh, difficult uh, personnel situations. But uh, during that period of time, I think a number of very constructive moves were made. Uh, we did get our financial situation back in order, and we began to grow the company uh, slowly, but uh, surely. But 1949 was a tragic year for Ed Ball. A serious labor problem at Ball Brothers had left him physically and emotionally drained. He and his wife Isabel and longtime friends Ray and Catherine Applegate left for Florida for a few days of rest and fishing. But the charter fishing boat exploded. Isabel and Catherine Applegate were killed and both men were seriously injured. Joe Navarro had worked for Isabel while Ed was in the service, and he remembers Ed coming back home after the accident. So he came home the next day. They brought it, flew him in the next day. And uh, when they took him out of an ambulance to bring him in the door, my hand was the first hand he reached for. He said, Joe, you back? And I said, yeah, I'm back. He said, thank you. He came home with a, you know, from Florida without his wife to three children who needed a mother and um, didn't go to the hospital. He went upstairs in the bed upstairs to be around us because he didn't want to be in the hospital. He wanted to be close to us. And, um, um, it's, uh, you know, it's just really a lot of courage to do that and still be there for us. Laura Schrader, an elementary school teacher at Burris, agreed to temporarily become a sort of substitute mother for young Frank, Marilyn, and Fred. Oh, wonderful. She was great, and the children loved her. I think she was a very good influence on me as a, a girl to some woman which I didn't have. I was this one little girl at that point with just men around me. And um, um, she was a, a important person. As soon as possible after the accident, Ed resumed his responsibilities and led the company through years of crisis to renewal. He reorganized, diversified, and modernized the company. But he still had three children to raise. He took fathering much more seriously than he had before. He was very busy with the company and, and uh, before that, and all of a sudden he was around more. And every night we would have dinner all together at 6 o'clock and talk about our day. And if you were late to that 6 o'clock dinner, you were really in the deep water. Besides Laura Schrader, the children fondly remember Joe and Mary Navarro and Wilma Cooper. I might not have done uh, private family work had I got something else to do. I might not have done it. 
See, but where they have children, you just love the children. You just, and I just love those children. I took time with them, you know. I let the work go, and they meant more to me than the work did. You know, as far as just being raised and being nurtured by them, you know, they're a big part of my life, and a big part of my brother Robert's life, too. Ed first met Virginia Bell Stewart at a family wedding in Texas. A pilot herself for 10 years, Virginia was an outdoors woman, a former music teacher, a rancher, and a Texan through and through. A society gossip columnist from the Houston Post got wind of the courtship between Ed and the young widow Virginia, but the writer got his name wrong and called him Edward Mason of the Indiana Fruit Jar Company. I was attending a family wedding in Dallas when on one of the occasions I observed this lovely lady across the crowded room. Later we found uh, many things in common. We liked uh, the outdoors and fishing and hunting. We found that we had more and more interest perhaps in each other. I invited Virginia to Muncie to meet some of my family and friends and she stayed with my mother during that time and uh, mother became fascinated and fell in love with Virginia, same as I had. I think maybe his attitude toward children is what really, because we're inclined, when Texas we're inclined to, you know, send them off or something, but that was sort of the pattern. And he first came down to see me, and he bought 27 people, three plane loads of himself <laughs> and children. And he came by and brought these kids all we threw them in the log cabin and we had a great time. And uh, so I was sort of acquainted with the whole family, but their whole warmth of the family and the way they felt towards children really impressed me. It was a year or so later that uh, we decided to get married in Dallas where we had first met. We uh, decided not to have a, an extended honeymoon. We went on a, an exciting one in our own airplane, flew out to Santa Fe into California and several other places, but we kind of cut it short because we both had families and Virginia was going to, just getting acquainted with my family. So we really cut it short and came home to um, get back into swing of things here in Muncie. Their marriage of nearly 50 years has been a union of common interests, flying, adventure, business, the environment, humanities, and the arts. I mean, he's the love of her life. I mean, they are sort of like, I was going to say Mutt and Jeff, that's not right, but just two peas in the pot, I guess that's how you describe mom and dad. You know, they're very uh, worried about each other constantly. I mean, they travel, they are a unit, I guess that's how you, and always have been. I'm not sure we are, we're quite different. I don't think we could have got along if we were like, I know we couldn't. Virginia made the difficult transition from Texan to Hoosier. Texans are pretty much uh, independent, can-do people. And Indiana was very conservative. That was the big change. All the freedom of the ranch to Riverside Avenue. Two children, Robert and Nancy, were born, bringing the brood to five. They returned to Texas for vacations and entertained friends at her two Texas ranches over the next 18 years. Ed may have inherited a fascination for the West from his ancestors, but marrying Virginia really got him into the cattle business. In 1955, Ed bought the Slash Triangle Ranch of nearly 50,000 acres in New Mexico and half the cattle on it. The ranch was the beginning of a long love affair the land of enchantment. I didn't know very much about raising cattle, but Virginia did. Now they have the Ortiz Mountain Ranch purchased in 1960. Through an arrangement with New Mexico's Nature Conservancy, it will be preserved for future generations. Meanwhile, the industrial world was changing. More and more family-owned companies were going public. Ball Brothers recognized the need for younger executives, but few candidates wanted to work for a 70-year-old family-owned fruit jar company. It was Ed's idea to purchase a small aerospace business in Colorado that already had the management talent in place. 
That small company, called Control Cells in 1955, has grown to be Ball Aerospace today. It made the first satellite to carry scientific experiments aboard, and more recently took on the difficult task of correcting the faulty lens on the Hubble Space Telescope. I've seen the company evolve from its first semi-automatic machines producing glass jars to exploration of our universe, from fruit jars to satellites. In 1957, Bertha Crosley Ball died, having lived a long life of outstanding service to many civic and philanthropic organizations. Mother was always there when she was needed. Short in stature, but a giant in accomplishments. In 1962, the Ball Brothers glass plant in Muncie, maker of the famous Ball canning jar, was closed forever. Unlike Ball plants in other cities, the old Muncie factory had outdated equipment and inefficient operation. It was the beginning of the deindustrialization of Muncie, and the announcement that hundreds of jobs would be lost was greeted with shock. Closing the Muncie glass plant was one of the most difficult decisions of my career. The plant had been in operation here for almost 75 years. A great many people were involved in the company, but we had spent millions of dollars trying to modernize, making the Muncie plant efficient and competitive, but we had not succeeded. It was a cancer that was eating the life out of the whole corporation. By 1965, Ball State Teachers College had outgrown its name and was now Ball State University. Only a few years later, in 1969, Ball Brothers Company changed its name to Ball Corporation, reflecting its growth and diversity. Most people think retirement means slowing down, but Ed Ball has spent the first 30 years of his retirement in full motion, much of it above the ground. 70 years of flying with more than 13,000 hours in the air, Ed has covered nearly 2 million miles, mostly with his fully licensed co-pilot, Virginia. They've landed in all 50 states, Mexico, Canada, South Africa, and six times in Australia, once on a cross-continental air race from Perth to Sydney. But Ed didn't limit his adventures to the air. Long before retirement, he had been introduced to scuba diving by a business associate. At age 67, remembering that dive, Ed took scuba lessons from longtime Muncie instructor, Tom Laird. There is no question that Ed is the, the oldest person that I've had to start diving, to proceed with such enthusiasm as he has through the last, I guess, 30 years or so that he's been diving, uh, it has been really fascinating for me to watch and, and be part of that. Since then, Ed has made more than 700 dives in many locations, such as the South Pacific, Bahamas, Cayman Islands, the Red Sea, and Australia's Great Barrier Reef. In addition to diving, Ed and his family have had a number of adventures. We went on safari, we went, you know, um, those were the wonderful trips. The, the safari because I love animals and I love seeing the animals and being in Africa. And um, I think that's unusual that they would always take us with them. I remember going to Italy when he's retracing his book and we'd meet all these people that he had written about and look out and see, well, this was Anzio and this is the monastery we stayed in. Dad did, did arrange a uh, trip up into the Northwest Territory and we stayed at the Plummer Lodge on the Great Bear Lake. It was Frank and Robert and I and Dad. It was a guy thing. It was a trip to the Northwest Territories. And I, I remember uh, at night, and it's at the, about the Arctic Circle, so it never gets dark. It was kind of twilight all the time. And, and we were pretty much in the little room in bunk beds with Dad and the boys. And Dad would recite, have you ever heard of the cremation of Sam McGee and the shooting of Dan McGrew, these Robert W. Service poems that are about 10 pages each. 
and he's sitting there in the dark reciting these things. He didn't miss a lick. There are very few, few things I think that Deb hasn't done. So uh, I, I'm not sure how many adventures are left out there that Dad hasn't done, but I'm sure that he will find those and, and do them. <laughs> Over the years, Ed Ball has served on hundreds of committees and boards. Because of his willingness to serve at all levels, usually behind the scenes, he became involved in the birth of public television. Serving as a lay board member for the National Association of Educational Broadcasters, he helped spearhead the formation of Public Broadcasting Service, or PBS. When uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting initially was formed, it was formed out of federal legislation. And they created something called PBS, Public Broadcasting Service, which was really part of CPB. But then, when President Nixon vetoed the uh, funding for public television, because he didn't like them doing public affairs, the uh, people who were chairpersons of the various boards got together at a meeting to discuss what to do. I must say that it was Ed Ball and Ralph Rogers together that saved PBS, and um, Ed never takes the credit for it, but he's the one who found Ralph. It is my conviction that there would be no public television as we know it today if Ed Ball and WIPB had not been stalwart supporters of the concept that public television had the potential to become the most constructive non-profit institution in each community and consequently in the entire nation. Ed helped bring Sesame Street to local children by working to start Muncie's own public television station, WIPB. It seems a few mothers were up in arms because their TVs could no longer receive Sesame Street, which was a nationally acclaimed program that both the moms and the kids liked. They asked Ed Ball to be part of that group and to uh, discuss whether they should in fact, put a station on. They were told it'll take a year or two years uh, or maybe longer to get the channel assignment and so on. And then at some point in the process, they discovered that channel 49 might be for sale. And so a fundraising effort was put in place and um, Van Smith actually was in charge of raising all that money and, and uh, Ed and Ralph Whitinger and a lot of people contributed to that. and. Um, Ultimately, the monies were raised, I think about $225,000. They bought the station lock, stock, and barrel, including the transmitter and the tower. And they put it on on Halloween, October 31st, 1971. Nearly 20 years later, Ed helped WIPB make a documentary called Art of the Dreamtime about Australian Aboriginal art. In 1988, the Edmund F. Ball Building was opened on the Ball State campus, housing telecommunications facilities, including WIPB. The building was built with state funds, but named for Muncie's own pioneer in public television. The same year, Minatrista Cultural Center was opened, another example of the Ball family's philanthropy, dedicated to the preservation of the area's history and culture. It stands on the former site of the Frank C. Ball home. A few years later, the home and gardens of George A. Ball opened to the public as Oakhurst Gardens. The legacy of the Ball family in Muncie is far-reaching. Ed Ball challenged the community originally to set up the Community Foundation. And when the Community Foundation reached $20 million, we called Ed and told him we were there. And he sent a note to the director of the foundation that said simply, great, when are we going for 30 million? And that captures so much this be as good as you can be, reach as far as you can reach aspect of Ed Ball. And we'll be at 30 million too in this community for that foundation because of Ed Ball's vision. And I think the transition from a manufacturing community into the new economy of the 21st century is well underway. 
and with the community foundation and all the other new entities that have been established, we're a much richer community for having a person like Ed Ball with us to help us through this process. In 1998, Ball Corporation moved its headquarters from Muncie to Colorado. The diversified corporation had gone public in 1972 and had been classified as a Fortune 500 company. Its manufacturing facilities had long left Muncie, and the location of its two principal businesses, containers and aerospace, were both in Colorado. Ball Corporation was no longer recognizable as the family business it once was. The move out of Muncie was no surprise and certainly made good business sense, but it was still hard to say goodbye. I knew this move was inevitable. I had hoped it wouldn't happen during my lifetime, but it did. The two remaining members of the second generation of Balls did not leave. Ed and his sister Janice Fisher still live in Muncie and are active in several foundations and civic and cultural centers, including the revival of Muncie's Masonic Temple. My father was active on the Masonic Temple Building Committee. The auditorium was financed by the Ball Brothers for the benefit of the community. Because local governments are transient, the donors felt that the auditorium itself should remain under the management of the Masonic organization. The aging building, now owned by the Masonic Community Building Foundation, is being restored and has become the community civic center. The auditorium has been appropriately named the Edmund Burke Ball Auditorium in honor of my father. Several buildings at Ball Memorial Hospital, now a regional medical center, memorialize the names of Ball family members. Now BMH is adding another building to its complex, the Edmund F. Ball Medical Education Building, named for the longtime chairman of the board. Ed and Virginia remain active in several civic and philanthropic activities and travel widely. Muncie's oldest member of the YMCA still swims regularly, and in 1996, on a trip to the North Pole, Ed set an unofficial world's record in his own mini triathlon. He walked around all the time zones in just a couple of minutes, took a quick dip in the cold water against the ship's doctor's orders, and rode a bike for a short distance over the ice. What's Ed's secret for accomplishing so much over seven decades of adulthood? You always have to have a project. You always have to have something, um, something to look forward to, something to dream about, something to improve upon. He always has these projects, these fun things that he does. It's a man that, um, that knows what's going to come next. Dad would always insist on leaving his uh, campsite in better shape than when he found it. And I always thought that, you know, Dad probably kind of lived his life that way. You know, everywhere he went is better off because of him uh, being there. That is something he has instilled in all the kids to make the world a better place and how we have left it. And his father told him that that's our responsibility. He was the best person that anyone would ever want to work for. They would treat you like you were a human being. Oh, he's kind. I don't know a kind of man. I really don't. I don't know if he's a lucky guy or if he's just smarter than everybody else. He just feels you have to do something good every day. You're a steward. Your life is just loans you. The legacy of the Ball family now extends into the next century through those whose lives have been touched by Edmund F. Ball. Well, I said once that when I grow up, I want to be like Ed Ball. In many, many ways, I would like to be like him. I didn't consciously do that, but I am a pilot. I was a cowboy. Um, I was scuba dive. You know, the only thing that I didn't quite follow him on is being a businessman. That's the only thing. I like the name Edmund. I think it's pretty cool. I, I want to name my kid Edmund, and I want to see how long it will go through all the generations. My goal is simple, to live as long as I can, do as much as I can, 
and accomplish as much good as I can.